Hi, I'm Dr. Stan Steindl. Welcome to Compassion in a T-Shirt. Today, I'll be speaking with Dr. Mats Hugmark. Mats is a medical doctor specializing in general medicine at Dalarna County Council in Sweden. He's also a motivational interviewing trainer and a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, which is where I first came to meet him. He runs trainings and seminars on motivational interviewing and communication skills with professionals from health and social services. He loves barefoot running and breakdancing, and he has a smile and a presence that really lights up a room. I hope you enjoy being in session with my friend, Dr. Mats Hugmark. All right, good. Well, welcome, well, thank uh, you. Dr. Mats Hugmark, um, to Compassion in a T-shirt in session. Uh, it's delightful, really, to um, get to speak to you all the way from Sweden. Um, yeah, right. I presume it's sometime early-ish in your morning and, and sort of evening for me. Yeah. Um, I was just, we were just reminiscing that um, I remember when we, we first met, I think it was, was it 2017? Was that the Malahide Conference? No, no, that's right, in Ireland. In Ireland, yeah. And uh, of course, we corresponded and sort of knew each other a little bit before then, but that was the first time we met and I remember arriving at the, you know, the sort of the hall to register and whatever. And in we came for the, the big hug. <laughs> yeah. I remember that very clearly. Yeah, that's, it felt like we had, we had known each other for quite some time, although we had only corresponded over yeah. email for about half a year or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it was, it was like um, sort of, you know, kind of old friends getting back together again. <laughs> but uh, of course, yes, yeah, so we, we know each other mainly from the motivational interviewing world. And yes. um, of course, that is a community that's very much like that. You know, lots of old friends getting to, to get together every now and then. Um, and so, um, yeah, I really appreciate you giving up some, some time to have a chat. How, how are things at your end at the moment? Well, they're fine, thank you. Uh, it's, it's 9 a.m. in the morning and uh, April 12th. So we have what we in Sweden call April weather. Yesterday we had seven or eight degrees uh, plus, uh, uh, beautiful sunshine. And now today it's snowing. So oh my gosh. It's, it's quite typical for this type of this, uh, this season. Uh, oh. Otherwise, just fine. Thank you. Well, I think, I think we got under 20 degrees Celsius this morning and I was like, oh boy, it's chilly today. <laughs> <laughs> but you're actually in a t-shirt stand, which is good. It goes with the title. I, I put on a, on a sweater as well. So. Oh, that's all right. That's all good. <laughs> well, I, I wondered if we could start just, um, yeah, just to, to sort of tell us a, a little bit about yourself, I guess, and, and um, well, your, your, your work. And, and in fact, I'd be very interested to hear sort of more about some of the things that you're doing work-wise, but maybe your life as well. And, and the, the sort of how you've gotten to, to, to be here. Absolutely, yeah. So, so I work as a physician. Uh, I'm specialized in family medicine, general practice. And I work in a primary health care center in the countryside in um, about 25 kilometers outside of the small city in which I live in, in Sweden. I've been at this center for about eight years. And before that, I worked in a primary health care center within the, the, the boundaries of, of the city. Hmm. So I've been, I've been a physician for about 18 years now. And, uh, and, and, uh, also, I, I, since 12 years or so, I'm at MI Trainer, and MIS in Motivational Interviewing. Mm. And uh, of course, I'm a practitioner. And I would say that I practice MI with all my patients to some degree uh, in, in all, all the consultations that I have. So mainly that's, that's what I do. And I work in the public health, um, the, the publicly funded sector of, of healthcare which is the majority of healthcare in, in Sweden. 
the, the, the place where I work, it's, I work within the county administration. It's, it's a regional system that caters to about 280,000 patients and around 9,000 employees. And, and I'm also the, the coordinator for all MI trainings within that, um, that region. So all the healthcare professionals within, within Dalarna, which is the name of the place I work in, they, um, when, when, whenever we have MI trainings for them, I'm sort of involved in, in, in one way or another. So th those are my main tasks professionally. Mm. And uh, well, personally, I, I, I'm a father of two. I have uh, two daughters, uh, 12 and 16. And they, they stay with me every, every second week. And then the, the other week they were with their moms. And uh, I like to go running. I, I'm a barefoot runner, <laughs> which means that most often I do have shoes on my feet, but very, uh, very thin sold shoes so to connect with uh, with the ground properly mm. so I, I do a lot of running and i do a lot of, of cycling as well both mountain bike and then go cycling in the in the in the roads I, I like to read books listen to music and listen to podcasts such as compassion in a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well you, you you sound like you have a a very sort of busy although really fulfilling kind of you know week you know what I mean at, at work for example like what what does your week really entail you know when when you're there yeah so I've been I've now during the pandemic I've been working more in the healthcare center but before that I have I worked about half time in the healthcare center meeting patients every every day and I, the rest of my time, I work with MI trainings, uh, like mm. I said, as a coordinating MI trainings. But now it's been more clinical work, of course, with, uh, with the pandemic. Mm. So I, I see patients and uh, I phone patients and I write letters to my patients and interact with them in, in various ways. And also, of course, supervising uh, training, junior training doctors, um, lots of things like that. Um, mm. So. And one of the thing, things that I do love about my work is that um, you get to meet all types of patients. Uh, I mean, there are men, women, all, all genders. There are, I have, I have children from four weeks old to uh, people who are 100 years old. And uh, there, there are um, somatic is illnesses, psychiatric conditions. Uh, I, I basically, I cover everything, which is, is quite... Um, it's one of the perks of being a general practitioner mm. and of course the continuity i get to meet my patients for many years sometimes and i get to meet their spouses and their children and their neighbors <laughs> you really get to know your patients in a way that is good for building relationships which mm. in turn often is very good for having those really difficult sometimes conversations about life and death and love and all things that that can be quite tricky to to talk to people about otherwise mm. yes it's a it's an amazing um role to have in a person and a family and a community um mm -hmm. my um my mother was a gp mm -hmm. as well and and um i remember her saying talking about similar joys of the job you know of, of sort of knowing families across the generation even and, yeah. and um, getting to see the babies and then also see them grow up and have babies of their own and yeah. and things <laughs> like that and there's the there's the colds and the the sort of the sprained ankles I guess but really yeah there, there are also you, you're there with people throughout all sorts of life experiences and and really some of the the most difficult times of their lives even and, yeah. and where things are you know perhaps are, are really going wrong for them absolutely yeah and 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 um, i mean just having that long-term relationship with uh, with a person is it it is something it's worth something it's uh, sometimes mm. i know that some of my patients they 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 really like coming to me not probably not because i'm the best physician there is because i'm not 
but because it's me and, and because they feel safe with me and they know that I know their story and 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 and, and that is um, it's one of the, the quite amazing things about having that continuous relationship, ongoing relationship with the patient. Mm -hmm. And it also makes my work a lot more fun, actually, and easier. Um, I don't need to look in the charts every time because I know the story, more or less. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to ask in a moment about compassion for you, because that's... Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a one trick pony. That's my, my <laughs> that's the word that I like. That's why you do it so well. Uh, yeah, but I, it, it just occurred to me, I'd, I'd like to just sort of stay with the notion of the relationship because I think with compassion, uh, that is almost the really, or can often be just such an important foundation to this thing we might go on to talk about compassion, you know, the, the, the relationship, the, the 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 safeness that you mentioned there, the the way that you can know somebody and understand them, and they feel safe with you, and and it's actually there's an element of joy even in that, but also I don't know, just a, a sort of a that that's just so much of the groundwork for then when there's suffering and when there's compassion. Yeah, definitely. It it's, uh, I mean, like I said, when, when you know someone or uh, when, when you feel safe, when the patient feels safe with me or with anyone else who works in healthcare and, and, and the healthcare provider as well need to feel somehow, I mean, we're safe because we're in our professional role, but, but sometimes you will really need to make that connection to someone to, in order to really feel that, well, I can, I can, uh, I can sit with your suffering and I can mm. just be with you when you have these thoughts and these uh, conflicts in your head. Uh, and and um, sometimes the relationship, you can actually form that connection quite quickly. Uh, I have experienced several times that a patient comes to me, someone that I've never met before. And uh, you just, would you open the door and you welcome them and then you have, you have your, um, uh, the, the white pajamas on <laughs> scrubs and and this, and then there's a name sign saying your name and, and then I'm a, a doctor and then you just open the door you you sit down you close the door and you say well tell me and then they immediately start crying and they give they, they just pour out their lives stories and yeah. and that's fantastic and, and somehow the, the safety in that in for the patient is probably not because it's me, because we've never met before, but it's because of the situation. They're in the healthcare center and all the familiar um, attributes of a, of a doctor. Mm. <laughs> and, um, yes. But I also need to feel safe in, in that situation to be able to mm. sit with their suffering. And yes. that can sometimes be tricky. Yes. Wow. The, the... So that's very interesting. On the one hand, safeness and security for the patient sort of arises out of a long-standing relationship and, and that that can be very powerful, especially as you see them over the years through the, the good times and the not so good times. But sometimes safeness um, can just arise in a moment and there's a sense that you know, meeting you, and maybe it's the trappings of the hospital and the, the outfit and, and, yeah. and so on. But also maybe it's the, the sort of the, 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 the nuance too of, of, of the greeting and of the welcome yes. and, and that yes. even those kind of micro moments and experiences there that creates that safeness too. No, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, the, the fine tuning of facial expressions and just, I mean, trying to express warmth and um, op being open minded to whatever they're going to say and, and not to be too strict on um, the doctor's agenda. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it says in the in the chart that someone is coming for a sprained ankle. Right. But once they sit down, then that's really not what they want to talk about. They want to talk about something else. They want to talk about how their child is um, addicted to drugs or how they are suffering because of physical abuse in the home or whatever. And then just being open 
to listening to what they want to talk about and then mm. that can yeah, you can actually show that by just being very open and friendly with your face sometimes mm. it's, uh, it's yeah. quite amazing how, how that works to, to promote to a sort of give that sense of safeness and i think not only the first two words like tell me but also what happens next if somebody starts talking about these difficult issues that you actually are are open to to lean back and, and just take in whatever is coming and uh, express empathy and uh, not not to tell them oh i understand but rather say wow that sounds really hard <laughs> Mm. and and to express empathy in that way it's uh, that creates an even larger even more safeness with the patient and mm. yes there's there's really is that um the the sort of the the facial expression the body posture the kind of openness mm. we sort of have to stop and just reflect on that occasionally don't we because little little quirks can sneak in and we can sort of, you know, be in a rush or, or we can have a little frown or something might occur to us and out it comes on our face. And yes, um, so it is yes. actually quite a great, it's a great reminder that, that we do want to notice our, our facial expression, our body posture, our voice tone, our eye contact. Mm. Uh, and, and then just to create that openness, but then also with what we do say as well. And that, that what we might say might really be more about empathy and, and expressing yeah. the understanding. And that too can then help to, to create safeness. And sometimes it's also, also a lot about the things we don't say, that we don't try to fix someone or say, well, it, everything's gonna be all right. You just wait and see and things like that. It's, perhaps that's not what they want to hear. That's not what they need to hear. Mm. Um, at least it, to my in my experience uh, healthcare professionals and probably that goes with many other people in help helping professions we're quite we're so eager to help that we we can we cannot stop ourselves from wanting to help people <laughs> mm. it's almost like when you have the urge to you need to go to the bathroom and you just cannot stop yourself and it's, it's sometimes it's, it's like that there's a good word for that in Swedish that it's probably not being you cannot translate it but when you just you just need to let it out but and sometimes maybe just don't do that try mm. just sit on your hands and and don't try to fix people yeah sort of trying to just breathe breathe and and yeah. pause <laughs> and and open up um because yes there might be the the sprained ankle and we can jump in at that point but as you yeah. said before there might be a whole other part to this presentation in fact mm -hmm. just really trying to sort of just to wait and to listen and to really understand the whole person is yeah. sort of what i think you're saying there and and that 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 takes just that little bit of time not not necessarily even much more time but just a little bit more time of of just of listening and and yeah it's, i don't know if this is a good time but if, may i share some uh, like really good things that i have found very helpful in my work uh, oh yes like please this model of, of thinking it's it's yes. um, there there's this method of consultation between doctor patient relationship uh, which which is based on on on, on sort of dividing the 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 whole consultation in three parts. First is the, the, the part of the patient, the patient's part. And then there's the, the doctor's part. And then there is the mutual part at the end. Okay. Uh, uh, and in the patient's part where you, uh, you, you need to stay there and you need to finish that part before you can go into the doctor's part. And in the doctor's part, usually you wanna ask like for how long have you had these symptoms? Um, tell me about what type of medications do you take? Like you need all these fact finding questions. Mm. And it's just like you said, it's really easy to, you see sprained ankle, it's in the chart and you immediately jump into the doctor's part, trying to ask, so what happened? Did you fall? Um, did you uh, have swelling? Uh, did you take any medications? You go there immediately. But then you forget about the first part, which is patient's part. And you need to first identify. So ask the patient, so tell me, what, what, how come you're here? What, what, what is it that 
that has happened to you and why, why did you come here? And ask, and then they may say, well, I did sprain my ankle, that happened, but I'm also quite worried for my, my son who is experiencing problems with addiction. Okay, so you, all of a sudden there are two things that I want to talk about. Mm. And then you explore, so ideas, concerns and expectations, the three, three things, I, C, E. So what, what ideas, what do you think about the, if, if the sprained ankle is what you want to talk about, say that's, that's the main issue. So what do you think about this sprained ankle? What, what are your thoughts that has caused it? Well, actually, I, I, I fell and I, um, it hurt really bad. And it's been a lot of swelling in my foot and I've been taking some painkillers, but it didn't work. So, so already then you know a lot and it all came from the patients. Hmm. And then I ask for concerns. So is there anything in particular that worries you about your sprained ankle? And maybe then they will say, well, I, I do think it is a spra a, just a sprained ankle, but I, I'm worried that something might be broken, that there might be a fracture or anything like that. Okay, so you're worried about a fracture. Expectations. So what do you expect from this consultation? Is there any, what, what do you hope that I will be able to help you with? And sometimes they will say, well, I want an x-ray. Or, well, I just want you to examine my foot and say that it's okay and, and give me a prescription on something stronger and then I'm fine. So you know what their thoughts are before they come. And then when you know all those things, then you can go into the doctor's part, examinations and well, fact-finding questions and all that. So, mm -hmm. so ICE, ideas, concerns, concerns expectations. expectations. Yeah. Mm. It's a very useful uh, method for uh, patient-doctor communication, but also I would say you can use it in other settings as well. Mm. Um, because then you know what the patient or your client, if you're a psychologist, you know what they are thinking about. You know what they're hoping for and you know what they are worried about. Mm. Uh, and then once you know that you can start working with those uh, issues, and I mean, it's perhaps, I, I don't think an X-ray would be the best thing for this patient, but at least I know that that's what they want. Mm. And mm. then I can address that in the mutual part at the end. I can say, so you were thinking you, maybe you needed an X-ray. Now I've been examining you in the doctor's part and, and it looks like there, this is not a fracture. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is not a fracture. We don't need to make an x-ray on this. How does that sound to you? And maybe they will say, well, I feel safe with, with that. It's mm. fine. Mm. Mm. And, and, and so this model is very good for, um, I, I actually think it's a good foundation for being a compassionate practitioner. Yes. Because you do listen to what your client, your patient is saying, and and you empathize with them. You can use phrases like, you know, I mean, well, that sounds really hard, or well, that must have been hurtful, painful for you, and 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 so you're worried. Yeah, you're worrying what's going to happen to you. I mean, you can display empathy, and you are also willing to show them that I, I want to help you as best as I can. And if an x-ray is what you need, that's what you're going to get. But if it's not what you need, we'll find something else that works better for you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the interesting thing that occurs to me is, as well is that out of the patient part at the beginning, yeah. um, you might, in fact, get a whole bunch of stuff that you now don't even have to ask in the, in the doctor's part. <laughs> Um, exactly yeah and you so you might of... just get a few little clarifications and and then you move on to the collaborative part and as both you and i know working in motivational interviewing we know that whatever the patient says is going to stick with them better than what i tell them so if yes. they get to tell me about their story it will remind them as well and, and then i will at the end i will just bounce back and i'll tell them so this is what you told me this is what I've found, and this is what I suggest we do now. How do you, mm -hmm. what do you make of that? And it, it is the, the, the basis, perhaps, of a compassionate conversation. Um, you can imagine wandering along the road, and there's a person, you know, perhaps sort of struggling with something. And 
it might be quite important to actually go through that same sequence, even in that scenario. Um, as, as you know, you know, the knowing what's best for someone or knowing what's what they should do uh, is sort of almost a, a near enemy of compassion. Some sometimes it, it, it sort of yeah. makes us less effective, less helpful. Uh, whereas the model or the method that you describe creates a kind of flow whereby actually we get to what really will be most helpful and also most helpfully uh, kind of, you know, discussed and, and arrived at together. Because the, it really makes the, the, the meeting into a, a, a collaboration between two experts. Mm. The patient is the expert on their experience and on their, how they, they what, what, what has happened and what they think about all these things. And I'm the, hopefully I'm the expert on the medical part. And at the end, in the mutual part of, of the consultation, we will work together as two experts to, to come up with a, an agreement on how to proceed and yes. how to follow up and all those things. Yeah. So there's the safeness and then there's the, the collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the kind of coming together to, you know, perhaps the, the most effective next steps, which yeah. we might do together or they might go away and try themselves or you, you might go away and, and organize some things too. Mm. And many opportunities for expressing empathy, like I said. So mm. actually... To without saying I understand to actually show that you yes. understand the predicament. Mm. Yes, that's the key, isn't it? That people feel that not only that you hear them or that you understand them, but that they feel heard and understood. Yes. <laughs> There's those two bits to it, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and sometimes that assessing, you know, or examining or fact finding is good for gathering information and maybe even understanding the person to a certain degree, but the other person doesn't then feel understood. No. Uh, and, and, and I think unless, until people, until I feel like someone has heard me and understood me, I'm going to keep banging on about yes. whatever it was that, that you know, I'm yes. trying to get, I'm going to say it again and I'm going to say, to say it again. <laughs> so it, it, empathy really facilitates safeness it facilitates collaboration but it also facilitates just the the efficient moving through of yeah. the the whole process as well i think now that's right if if you don't make people feel understood they will do just what you said now stan they will continue to push it and they will say it again and they will say it again until you say well that sounds really hard wow so you've been you've been struggling with this for quite some time and and sometimes what I do as well is I tell my patient, so I'm really happy that you came to me today to discuss mm -hmm. these things or something like that. So good that you, so good that you came because sometimes you get a feeling about that. Why are they pushing so much? Yeah, because they want to hear that they didn't come for nothing or they, they are not a burden to me or something like that. Because mm -hmm. some, a lot of patients, especially the, the older patients they feel they don't want to be a burden to the healthcare system mm. but they they well i'm taking up someone else's precious time and some uh, another patient could have been here instead of me or something like that it's mm. quite common actually and if you just tell them that well i'm happy that you came <laughs> mm. it's good that you're here so we can talk about these things mm. uh it, it helps mm. it, it sort of uh, decreases their level of anxiety and it makes them feel more safe and um, more accepted as well. It, I think it, there's a lot of acceptance uh, issues here. Uh, you actually need, sometimes you just need to say that, I think it's okay, you're okay. You're okay for being worried about these things. You're okay for wanting to get help with uh, your suffering. You're okay for, for coming to me and uh, just, actually telling them that mm. it's, uh, it's quite uh, powerful sometimes mm. yes it, it's it can be unhelpful if there's that real hierarchical relationship isn't it where the yeah. the patient sort of sees the doctor as somehow more important or superior or or, or the doctor sees themselves as that or, or the other health provider or but but rather you know i, I guess making the relationship equal in in a sense but but sometimes 
actually elevating them is is yeah. very powerful where you might actually say look i i think it was actually really clever that you came along today yeah. these are important things to discuss and and i admire the way that you've you've actually handled all of this so far you know it shows that you've put a lot of careful thought into it or you know whatever and and you're actually in a funny sort of a way honoring them and elevating them and and certainly accepting as well is is key that's uh, yeah i i just love what how you express that stan and and there is this article that we've heard about in um, in the conference in in malahide that you, you mentioned in 2017 bill miller from the mi community he talked about taking the lower place uh -huh. the, on, on uh, an evolutionary um, perspective on why does motivational interviewing in work and I mean doing that actually look just like you say looking up to the patient and say well it was really brave of you to come here or I admire you for having persisted for so long and, and I mean doing that it not putting yourself as a practitioner in the higher place but rather in the lower place looking up to the patient it's mm. it's um it really promotes um, safeness with the patient and that mm. non-judgmental stance it's i think it really i think more people in healthcare should think about these things because we often tend to have that reflex of wanting to fix people like i said we, so mm. we just cannot stop ourselves from wanting to help people and mm. and that can be quite threatening to some people i know for a fact that some people feel really threatened that somebody just told me that i needed to do this and well i they don't didn't even listen to my to my problem mm. and i didn't feel heard so yes i remember that talk from bill now that you you mention it and and um and, and yes, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, when were we most in danger? Well, it was when we were kicked out of the group, you know, and, and on our own. And, and so yeah. social threat is, is one of the big ones for, for human beings. And, and, mm. and part of that is that sort of social rank theory, isn't it? Where we, we're not always trying to uprank, but it's very, threatening to be downranked you know to, to, yeah. to, to go down in the hierarchy and, and if a, if an experience with a health professional or, or, or anybody else that we might um, you know meet and, and deal with feels like we're, we're going down rank then then it activates threat system and now all of a sudden yeah. fight flight mode or whatever and and now it, it's much harder to, to sort of be helpful too I think then when people are, yeah. are feeling threatened like that. And, and I mean, as a patient coming into a healthcare facility, whatever the reason is, you are more or less bound to feel inferior in a way because you are the one with the problems that need some help. Mm. And somebody that the one that you're meet, meeting sits with uh, a power over you to actually say, yes, you're going to get this or no, you're not going to get this. So, so you really, as a, as a provider, you really need to be mindful of that, that um, power imbalance. Mm -hmm. Whether you think, well, I'm, I'm not uh, taking any power over anyone, but, but just in the name of your profession, you are. And you yes. need to be aware of that. And, and so, I mean, we cannot completely take that part away, but we could, we could um, make it less obvious by really thinking about it really thinking I've, about I've it, and... it i haven't been a patient myself very many times but but it has happened a few times and even though i know i'm a doctor myself but whenever i come into a healthcare facility i do feel a little bit uh inferior to the people who are there to try to help me because they are a, they are in a power position in relation to myself so hmm. It, it just happens it, it's it's sort of in a way built in to the system in a sense yes. but that doesn't mean yeah. we can't also do things that create a somewhat more even playing field 
Um, okay. Certainly, because I guess the next bit is, is is then the respect piece as well. <laughs> we've got the, the the safeness, we've got the collaboration, we've got the empathy, the acceptance, and the respect. You know, we, though, I mean, they're they're sort of it's easy to roll them off the tongue, but um, but those are all such important elements of of effectively helping. Mm. But we need to remind ourselves that that's what we're here for. We're here to mm. help other people and. And, and to be, to, to, to see their suffering and try to uh, make, make it better and perhaps even sometimes try to prevent that suffering and from happening again. And, yes. And, and that's, that's having that compassionate outlook on, on people. And mm. At the same time as having a, having a compassionate outlook on yourself as a provider, because sometimes yes. self-compassion exactly. is one of the... <laughs> yeah, please continue. Well, I, I'm I'm excited you mentioned that because it it <laughs> my my mind was was going back to something that you said at the start, and and that is all of those things we're wanting for the patient, but we're also wanting a sense of safeness for the helper or the the doctor or the health practitioner, and uh, and in fact our own social threat radar can go off sometimes and we can, you know, we, we can actually be, you know, enthusiastically wanting to help or to fix the problem, but some of the motivation there might actually be threat system too. You know, we're feeling threat system activation because of the system we're working in or the outcomes we're meant to get or the fact that this isn't going anywhere and what if something really bad happens for this person? And so before you know it, you've got the, the kind of the patient who's feeling all threat system activated and in a way that the, the clinician feeling kind of threat system activated too and that's when we get into the into the struggle yeah because yeah you, that that's so right you, my threat system can be activated by looking just looking at the at the clock and seeing that wow i have a new patient coming here in 10 minutes and we're not even close to being done here that that's mm. that activates my system and sometimes it's I want to help this person. I really, I know what, what he or she would need, but it's not going to happen because of long waiting times with the orthopedic surgeons. They're not going to see this patient for, mm. for several months or, well, things like that. That could activate my threat system. Sometimes the patient can activate my threat system mm. by being um, difficult with, within quotation marks and, mm. uh, or by being, some patients are... Um, for different reasons, they can, can be quite um, aggressive. Often it's because they are afraid, of course, or they're um, feeling threatened themselves, but that can activate my threat system. So just to be aware of, of how, the, uh, how this, this, this can affect each other and you can turn into an upward spiral that is not going to be, or maybe a downward spiral actually, because it's not gonna be very helpful. Work with self-compassion to pat yourself on the shoulder and say, "Well, I'm doing my best here. Mm. I'm doing as best as I can, and it's it's actually quite that it's good enough." Yes, yes. The, the sometimes the the most complex patients are actually the interplay between the internal and external factors of the patient and the internal and external <laughs> factors of the practitioner. <laughs> And that's, and you know there, there's there's both of those things going on and and yeah. um, and so self compassion uh, as a part of compassion is, is kind of just such an important uh, balance there um, and I suppose for us too it's still about body posture facial expression inner voice tones <laughs> um, even a little bit of self acceptance self respect empathy for our own experience of this you know all of those same oh, these are the <laughs> yeah so the really tricky tricky things for helpers I, absolutely I, in general it has been for me and i know it's the same for many other people in professions like ours where we we're getting paid to help people who are feeling bad about things and mm. It is easy. I mean, I know compassion fatigue is, is a term that is sometimes used or a physician burnout and things like that. It's, I think it often comes from, from feeling that I'm the, the things that I do are not good enough or I'm inadequate in, in, or the system is inadequate and I'm a part of that system. And yeah, I think, I think we need to uh, be kind 
to ourselves as well. And but to, it's, uh, but it's sometimes so we hard. need to listen to ourselves. Like, what are my my ideas, concerns, and expectations on, on, on all of this? <laughs> I was just gonna get. I was thinking that myself. You know, like the the ice um, method you mentioned before really can apply to our own self reflection around all of that. I, I really think clinician shame is a is a big yeah. part of it you know that sense of inadequacy i'm not good enough i'm not being helpful can be very very threat activating and and yeah. and being able to look at you know all of those elements there you know not not least expectations of ourselves and 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 find a way towards kindness so how how do you do it you sort of mentioned that you know it's it's tricky and self compassion is is tricky what are there any things that you've stumbled across that 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 kind of work for you in terms of your own self-care or self-compassion yeah it's uh, i mean some of the things that i mentioned already that things that i like to love to do in my free time is like go running i mean or go cycling and i mean physical exercise uh, pre preferably outdoors in nature is uh, is one of the things that it's, it's good i mean we know these things it's physical exercise is good for a lot of things but mm. it, it's it's a place of just relaxing and then letting go of things sometimes i do think about work related stuff and i sort of mull them over in my head as i go running in the in the woods but it's, it's also quite good because when i get home then i've sort of dealt with them already mm. uh, so that's one way of practicing myself compassion and acceptance can you tell us a little bit more about the barefoot part of that i mean is is that is is that an actual key piece in it do you think that 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 contact with the ground that you mentioned very briefly at the start but yeah is, is that in there it, it is actually it's I, this all uh, and there was a book called born to run that probably many people know of that came out about, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. It, 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 a journalist wrote a book about, about uh, Mex Mexican tribes running with more or less barefoot and it, and it sort of kicked started a big uh, movement across the globe to, uh, to sort of go back to the natural way of running. So, which is, I mean, the, we've, we've only had uh, air cushioned soles for about 40 years but we've been running for hundreds and thousands of hundred thousands of years so it's uh, so that's what kicked my interest as well but now i'm more i i don't run barefoot more than occasionally but it has it there's something about connecting to the ground i mean when i put my feet down and uh, i i can actually feel stones and and uh, cones from the pine trees. I can feel them under my sole because I don't have a three centimeter thick sole that, that cushions everything. And, and there is something about that. Hmm. I think self-compassion self is often about concepts of connection, belonging, yes. um, yeah. you know, sort of um, even kind of nature and the environment. Um, exploring openness curiosity you know all of that really is is in there yeah. i think with with self-compassion and i i wondered yeah that 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 has been a little avenue that you've just discovered for yourself really helps yes. to ground you and and create that that sense i know you also love music and yes. special types of dancing <laughs> <laughs> Break and dancing, break dancing, <laughs> and there's a few other. Uh, well, very. I mean, there's uh, the joy as well, isn't there? Actually, yeah. you know, compassion and self-compassion. And you mentioned this with with patients too, but with self-compassion as well. You know, joy can be in there in there as well. Yeah, I mean, sometimes even with the with some patients who are struggling the most, or or I mean, really that. I, as a physician, feel that, wow, it's amazing that you're even here. I mean, that took a lot of effort just coming here today. It's, mm -hmm. and I often try to tell them that as well. I mean, in talking about affirmations, it mm -hmm. can be quite powerful for a patient to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
with some of those patients, I mean, it, it's not a very, we're not having the brightest of moments together. It's not like we're not, it, it, we're, we're not laughing and singing together because we're talking about serious stuff. But even in those moments, sometimes there is room for laughter or for just connecting and, and mm. there's room for joy. And, and uh, I think, I think it matters mm. trying to sometimes um, when, when everything looks dark and hopeless for some people, then actually knowing that, well, at least you're here and, and, mm. and, I'm, and, and make them see that, um, see that for themselves. And they often do. I mean, I, it would be stupid of me to tell them, well, at least you're breathing or you can talk. I mean, don't, it's not that bad. I, I would never say that, but if they could say that for themselves, well, well at least I'm here and I, I I was able to drive my car to come to you, see you today. And, mm. and I do have a lovely dog that I can go for a walk with every day. And if, if they can say that, we can actually laugh about that as well and, and find some joy in it. And then mm. it, it, it brings light and it does bring hope into the darkest of stories. And I think that is what compassion is about as well and trying mm. to help people find that mm. in themselves. Yeah, no, that's that that that's beautifully said by you there too. The the um, and and the thing that really has stuck with me from from our chat today is, is that beginning piece of safeness. You know, isn't it funny how we have to feel safe to to tell another person our deepest, darkest, you know, kind of bits. But often, we also need that safeness to be able to. Oh, you know, and laugh even, or yeah. experience the, you know, some joy or hope, or you know that it, it, the the safeness is is so important. I, I stumbled across a a Carl Rogers quote once from a talk he did, where he said something. You you've probably come across it too, but he said something like, you know, I want the person to feel so safe that things that can't be said can be said, and yeah. feelings that can't be experienced can be experienced that, that is my intent he says and and actually you've really you've really opened that up for me because actually the things that can't be said and the, the feelings that can't be felt sometimes those might be the very hardest ones and and it, but sometimes it might be the at the positive end of the spectrum as well mm. you know the, the people can often have fears around even joy or happiness or or relaxation or safeness there can be it takes that it takes safeness to to get yeah. there as well and, and just trying to somehow create an, an environment or an atmosphere within that 30 minute consultation of it's okay to ex, to explore all these things it's okay to be sad it's okay to cry it's okay to laugh and you can do all those things within the same 30 minutes it's mm -hmm. uh, and i mean it is difficult but uh, um, it, with practice you get better at it uh, mm. again our guru in mi community bill miller he has said something that i i really take to heart and i, I often talk about it in my trainings that con the, the practice of mi teaches you compassion and, uh -huh. and I think I think that really goes a long way. I mean, the more you practice on something, the better you get. And the more you practice sitting with someone who is suffering, well, the better you get at it. And, mm. Mm. and think, not mm. not to say that I'm perfect because I'm not. I often fail, but but I do my best. And then I just pat myself on the shoulder and say, well, you, at least you try today, and maybe mm. I can learn something and do better next time. Because you cannot, you cannot really, you cannot save the world. It's, it's, it's impossible. You can only do so much and, and be happy for that. And that's one way of, I think, of also preventing compassion fatigue or practitioner burnout, just to be aware of these things. And mm. It's really not up to me to save someone else. I can just, I can be there and I can help them with some tools or I can help them with follow up or um, medications or whatever but but in the end uh, it's not it's really not up to me and and, and, and that's I think that's like there is some comfort in that mm. Mm. for a practitioner mm. yes now that is that's a really lovely spot to finish I, I think that's absolutely right so um 
I was just going to check in with you before I let you go. Um, if people were wanting to be in touch or connect with you or see the sort of stuff that, that you're doing there in Sweden, um, yeah, yeah did, is there anywhere they can find you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the easiest way for most people would be to uh, email me on, okay. uh, on mats, M-A-T-S, at hogmark.com. So that's my, my last name, dot .com. I think my name is, will be on the list of the, of the, the title of this show. So mats at hogmark.com. And I'm also on Twitter. I, I, um, I'm, although 98% of my uh, Twitter uh, feed content is, uh, is in Swedish, but I'm, I'm quite good actually in, on Twitter. But so if, if people want to reach out to me there, it's at Mats Hogmark, one word. Yeah. Okay. Is there a translate button on Twitter? Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I think there is. I think there is. Although I think, I, there is. I think a lot of stuff will get lost in translation. But okay. That's good for sure. But they, can, okay. they can send me direct messages. That's if, if, if people want to get in touch with me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. May I just share? A, a, I have a, a, a couple of tips. I know that you sometimes you end up with a few tips. I, I just wanted to finish with a few because I did prepare a little bit for this. Okay. This. Great. <laughs> I was a bit. I was a bit nervous, but then I, again, I tried to practice some self compassion and say, "Well, Mats, you do know a few things about this, and whatever is." you say it's going to be okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm so, all ears. What are your <laughs> No, the well, first tip would be to actually read books and read poetry. Ooh. To me, that's one way of getting better at finding empathy for, for people of different mm. situations. I mean, you learn a lot about people and the lives of people by just reading literature and, and fiction. Mm -hmm. so that, that's one thing it's also a good way of connecting with with the world around you so that that's my first tip i'd say uh, and the second is to uh, yeah we talked about to be kind to yourself uh, relax exercise all those things and the third thing is to actually pause before you speak and, or before you act again it's i mean to sit on your hands you don't need to fix people so those are the three things I, I would like to read. Mm -hmm. Read, especially poetry, even. Yeah, um, that, that's a that's a wonderful tip. I I I, I, I try to, to do that too, but it's a it's a, a great idea. Um, be kind to oneself. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of yeah, not 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 easy, but but very important. Um, and the third tip to uh, yeah to do what you just do now to be quiet <laughs> to be to pause <laughs> the third tip is to pause and yeah. and to to listen excellent well thank you very much matt for coming on to compassion in a t-shirt in session <laughs> thank you um, and now yeah. i'm so i'm warm so i need to take off my sweater and actually be in a t-shirt okay <laughs> right yeah well i'll i'll let you do that off camera perhaps but, um, i think that yes yeah, so. excellent thank you very much thank you Stan.